set up within a lot of interactions and activities in the business environment, still have a kingdom community that I'm overseeing and uh, having to delegate a lot of things there and gone into Liberia where we began with church leaders, now we are dealing with government in issues of bringing a nation back from its knees to bring things into the environment and seeing how God has a complete design that the world actually needs. The saddest thing for me in our current political structure is that the people who should be advising the leaders are trying to get the leaders to endorse them. It's a completely turned up scenario. We really had a scenario I've shared with you in Liberia where the vice president wanted to meet with us and we refused to meet her. And the reason was very simple. The pastors wanted us to meet her, wanted us to meet with her so we can pray with her and take pictures. I think I want grown pictures. There are better things to do in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so we said to them that the time we will be willing, and by the way, her pastor is a very close friend. Many times when she's in a crisis, she calls me, we pray. That's not the issue. I said the time we will sit with her is when we have things that we want her to endorse for implementation Amen. in the nation. Amen. That we are interested in. Mm -hmm. Prayer, Liberia is 98% Christian. They have enough pastors. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a they don't need us to pray. Mm -hmm. They're very good at praying. That's not our direction. The, at the beginning of this year, we had a, a kingdom economic conference in Liberia. And I told them that the amount of years they have prayed is enough. Now we want to implement what they prayed about. Mm -hmm. It's true. So there's so much in the spirit you have prayed. The, the atmosphere of the nation is pregnant with your prayer. But it's looking for a place to express itself. And if we don't do it, we'll have a situation like what we had in the Old Testament. Israel was God's chosen nation. But Israel did not have the structures to preserve people in a famine. So God had to send Joseph to Egypt. Because only Egypt had the infrastructure that could preserve nations. That's the reality. That's the truth. Now, to be able to move in this dynamic, today I want to start with a preamble. A primary preamble which should help most of us identify our functionality in kingdom economy. And I want to do that by separating the difference between a Christian business person and a kingdom business person. They are not the same thing. A Christian business person, a kingdom. Because many people are Christian business people with kingdom dreams. Those two cannot be in the same context. You cannot have a Christian business person's mentality and expect to operate in a kingdom economic structure. You are too limited. And let me explain the differences and you'll see why. One of the natural beliefs of a Christian business person is that God is my business partner. Right? That's how a Christian business person thinks. Listen, neither is wrong. They just have spheres of influence. A Christian business person can be a blessing to family, to community, maybe even to church. But a Christian business person cannot affect a nation. That's a problem. A kingdom business person operates by very different laws. So, where a Christian business person sees God as his partner in the business, meaning I have a business and God is my partner. A kingdom business person is in a business where God is the owner. He just manages it for God. Now let me explain from economic structures the differences in meaning. Let me use the simplest example I can use. You can run your own chicken business. Okay? Mm -hmm. And in the chicken business, you can have 50 chicken, 100 chicken. You can do very well. You can prosper. You can be a blessing. 
you are a good tither, you give good offerings, your family likes you, every crisis they call you, they know you will donate, very good. Or, you could be a manager in Kenchik, limited, which right now is in five countries in Africa. Who do you think makes more money? The manager of Kenchik or the owner of 100 chickens? Yet the manager is employed. Why? Because the manager, there are certain things he doesn't need to take care of. They are taken care of. He doesn't worry about food, doesn't worry about shelter, doesn't worry about transport, doesn't worry about any of those things. His job is to grow the business, to make sure it has impact in the territories where it is. I'm using that example specifically because the current manager for this region of Africa is actually a believer, good friend of ours. He's actually a son of Sirovini, he's a Kenyan. Overseeing Lusaka, Nairobi, Burundi, Rwanda. Listen, just to give you a picture. You know Kenchi gives day-old chicks, right? How do you give day-old chicks to every country in five countries every day? What do you think of the logistics for doing that? The chicks have to be their old chicks. So today, as we are talking, in every of those five countries, they gave over 10,000 people a day old chick. What do you think that guy is managing? So I asked him, so why do you give day old? Why not even the next day? He said, because just changing by a day means we have to feed a million chicken. It's very expensive. <laughs> so we give you the old, so you feed it from the world of food. Look at the efficiency. No feeding cost. Look at the efficiency of that system versus the person whom they give the chickens to. To run their, remember the one I talked about? The hundred chickens. Where do they buy from? Ten chickens. That's the real difference between a Christian businessman and a kingdom businessman. Christian businessman has to think about how to get chickens to the next town. Kingdom businessman is already in how many nations? Ultimately. Are you seeing the parallels? So, if we want to touch nations, our business must leave our hands and get into God's hands. As long as, I, and it's okay, you can start here. It's not a bad thing. You can start by being a Christian businessman. Sustenance, income, family. It's a good place. But the ultimate journey must be to reach a place where you allow the real investor to take over the business. It's called the King of Kings. So everybody sees you. But truly, the one who owns the business. Now, that's one factor. The second factor, the Christian businessman owns a business and he uses it to bless the church. Christian businessman. He owns a business and he's a blessing to the church. He's a blessing to people. But the business is whose? It's his. Kingdom businessman is actually entrusted with what we call a kingdom asset. He's entrusted. What does that mean? What's the difference between one who contributes and one who has an asset? The next point. The Christian businessman will regularly ask God to bless his business. Isn't it? You come to ask for prayer, right? Pray for a blessing, from, pray for my business to prosper. Notice even the conversation. Pray for my business to prosper. Remember, I'm telling you this is not bad. It's where we start. Okay? A kingdom business person does not pray for his business to be blessed. His business is blessed. Here we don't waste prayer praying for business to be blessed. Here we align with God's voice and we just want 
a different dynamic. I'm talking about things that I experience. Here, everywhere God has sent you to go, it is guaranteed you will succeed. So your prayer is for wisdom, not for business. Totally different dynamic. Here you go, doors open. The most important thing in this movement is what is in God's heart concerning this place. What does God want to do? So how do we do it here? I assume today, and I'll tell you how this normally works. Here, if I was trying to go to Liberia from here, I would have to raise capital. I would rise to look at my savings and maybe borrow some money. Alright? Here, I simply announce that our next assignment is in Liberia because God has sent us. And money begins to show up. People call and say, I heard you're going. Here's a ticket. People, I heard you're going. This is what I'm doing. This, let me tell you, this is really it happens. It's a different dynamic. You go to the nation, you meet a minister of government, you say this is what we want to do, you say, no, leave alone that. We want to give you all this to do. Why? It is a kingdom assignment. It is not my business. Meaning what will be activated in these resources will transform lives and nations. Here, it transforms your life and your jurisdiction. It is limited to where you have influence. It is limited to who you are connected to. This one is connected to the purposes of God. So this one is a very different environment. This is the place where we, 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 we put Psalms on. Whatsoever you put your hands to do, so as well. This is what it is. It's a different dynamic. In the Christian business, I not only ask God to bless my business, He also asks Him to bless my decisions. Because I just said, ah, Lord, I want to expand and get three more farms. Please bless me. Listen, He will do it. Please understand, I'm not telling you this is wrong. I'm just telling you when you're here, you learn the dynamics of here. When you are there, you learn the dynamics of there. Here, don't talk so don't start talking about millions, and hundreds of millions. It doesn't work like that. Because if millions enter here, they will crash this system. You will suddenly forget who God is. Because remember it's your business, not his. Here is the place where you look at your prophet and you remove your tithe. Here, God tells you, give a hundred million, you release it, you don't calculate. It's like the company head office telling you from account A, move money to account B. Do you call the boss and say, listen? <laughs> this is not how we do business here. Do you know the liabilities we have today? Do you know how many people we need to pay? You get the difference? Here the movement has changed. Here, money is just a facilitator of obedience. Here, money is a source of life. <laughs> Here, the difference between spending and there are two different mentalities completely. Here, we can raise money 20 people to accommodate one church meeting. Here, one person can pay for that entire meeting. Two different dynamics. And that person might not even be a member of that church. Might not even attend the meeting. Might not even know what will be preached. Because they got an instruction from God, they did not respond to an appeal. Two dynamics. Here, my priority is to have a successful business. I want to be successful. And today, a lot of the things I'm going to teach are for here, more than that side. Why? Where do we all start? So don't feel bad if you're here. Excel here so you can move there. That's where I'm coming from. So that is not going to be our major discussion today. This will be, but I wanted us to know this is a starting point. 
God's intention is for us to align here. Here, my priority is not success. My priority is God's intent. You know what that means? It means here, I can be told to send 10 million to a people I don't know, so I can never measure the impact. What am I responding to? A voice. Here, I want to know the outcome. By the way we gave, what did you do with the money? <laughs> I want to know what my money is doing. It's a level. But we need to outgrow it quickly. Because the nations are shifting. When you see, read scripture and talk about the wealth of the wicked being transferred to the just, that scripture is for that side. When you talk about all oh, the great money transfer, you know amazing things. We're talking about that side. You cannot live there if you have not succeeded here. Because certain things here are going to affect you, you will not know what to do. If you've never been here and outgrown this. That is just my intro of separating the two dynamics. Now I want to talk about really what my topic is today, which is based on what the topic was. Pathways to wealth. I have to give you that background because the pathway I'm giving you should bring you here eventually. So there are going to be some very important issues that you need to grow here. So being successful here is good, but being successful here is for you. God is here to prosper you. God is here to bless you. God is here to take care of you and those around you. Here, you are God's hands that blesses people. You are God's hands. When people pray to hear God, you are the answer. Here you are the one praying. <laughs> you understand? Here you are the one saying, Lord, right now I need a breakthrough. You know angels don't bring breakthrough. They don't. Men do. But the men who bring breakthrough must have arrived here where they can hear God. <laughs> if they are not here, your prayers will suffer. The reason many prayers have not been answered is because there are not enough people on this side. Wow. That was the greatest thing that God ever taught me. Not only do you know something, many of the things you've prayed for last week are in the hands of someone who just can't hear me. That's all. They have it, but they can't hear me. So, my primary job is to get as many people on this side as possible. I am no longer worried about getting people here. This is not difficult. Surprise, this is very easy. There are certain principles I'll share with you today. Those principles, you leave them as a life, the outcome is almost guaranteed. That's not the problem. The problem is that while you're growing here on the things I've taught you, Many people who are already here will be the people who make you succeed there. You'll be surprised. God works through men. I always ask myself a question. There are some hidden things in scripture. It is said, it's written, there's a time Jesus needed to pay tax, right? And you know the story. What was, it? What was Peter told? Go catch a fish. So Peter, Operated from here. Yeah, you have to have skill. First of all, you have to be a fisherman. You didn't send it to us. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Judas does not know how to fish. So, first of all, they had, he had to have the what? The skill to fish, not just anyone they sent. Two, he had to have a boat, the resources. Then he gets a fish. The fish has a gold coin. None of us ever asked, where did the gold coin come from? Sometimes, my theory, not in the Bible, so don't say that in the Bible. This is my speculation. Somebody that day lost a gold coin. And it fell out of his pocket. 
brothers in the river. Or they were fighting with his brother. They were both greedy, so the coin rolled and entered the river. And that was the end of it, it entered the sea. And that was time for somebody else to be paid. Have you realized that the money you lost is never burnt? That's true. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you? How many of us have lost money? If you're like me, you should have lost a lot. It's part of the training. <laughs> <laughs> the money you lost in your life is still functional somewhere. Someone has it, the exact amount of money. Yeah, money transfers, it doesn't disappear. The question is never, there is no money. The question is always, whose hands is in it? it part time, it's in someone's hands. All right? So that's the background we're coming from now. Today I want to talk about Kingdom capital. You know, in business, the term capital is a very known term, isn't it? Everybody needs capital. But if, if, I, if, I, if I talked about capital, your first reaction, what is capital? Who can tell me? Just off the cuff. What is capital? You all business people, you don't know what capital is. And you have to start much earlier. This is a problem. <laughs> If we don't know capital, we haven't even started yet. Sum of cash that to start a business with. The sum of cash that you start a business with. That's the simplest example you can give. Who has a different opinion? Who agrees with what you just said? You know, if you're like that class, I should normally ask. Yeah? <laughs> how many agree? Ten. How many disagree? Ten. You are the ten. What are you? <laughs> You've never agreed nor disagreed. Anyway, the principle is this. In our understanding of business, in our understanding of the world of economy, we've all been taught that that is capital. Capital is cash, capital is financial, capital is money, right? That's what we've always taught. As I have taught me a lot, I discovered there are seven types of capital. So I'm going to talk about today. Money is just one. And in, the, in my list, money is not number one. Money is actually number five in my list. <coughs> so let me give you. It is true we need money to scale, to increase, to expand our business. It is true. But there are other factors which if you don't have, money cannot replace. And in fact, if anything, you'll probably lose money if you don't have. Alright? So the first form of capital is intellectual capital. Intellectual capital. Intellectual capital, from the same word intellect, is the unique knowledge, skill, or ability you must have before you engage any form of enterprise. In the, in the most simplest form of intellectual capital, a plumber has intellectual capital. You look at your plumbing and your problems. Have you ever tried this? You see water gushing from somewhere in the house or something is going wrong. And, and if I was to ask you, you have some sort of idea what should be done. Until the plumber comes and the direction it goes doesn't make sense to you. When he shows up, you are thinking he should plug this pipe. He tells you, let's switch off the main taps. And then, why are we going there? What connection does that have with what we're about to fix? Then he says, it's not about the vast pipe, it is pressure coming from this other tank. That is intellectual capital. Now, what most people who, who fail in business is we do not know the value of intellectual capital. At all. In other words, in my interesting business life, I remember working for an electrical uh, company. We used to repair people's things. Bust uh, cable, not younger, probably 19 or 20 then. And I still remember the guy who I was working under. So people would say things like they want the plug replaced, right? And um, a plug, if it was today, maybe it would cost what, 60, 70 shillings. And the fellow would charge them 670. And I would tell, tell him, why are we charging that much money? He said, no, I'm charging you 70 for the plug and 600 for the ignorance. 
That's the intellectual capital. If they knew what to do, they should have done it. That is why if, you, if, if you're in Europe or Australia or those nations, you don't call anybody if you're not willing to pay because the rates are very high. What they do is they send you a manual. Fix it yourself. If you can't, the fellow coming will charge you for his time, for his Uber, and for his knowledge. It doesn't matter what it is you think you need fixed. Those ones are set costs. Before he arrives, today you understand it a bit. I don't know if it happens in Nairobi, in Akuru, but in Nairobi we use borders a lot for deliveries. Okay? So whatever you buy, you're told, and border, 300. In other words, irrelevant of what the price of your product is, transport remains yeah. constant. You get the idea? So that is the real issue. That's intellectual property. So what is your intellectual property? Forget your financial capacity. In your business, whatever you are doing, what is it that is unique to you that makes you different? What makes you special? Right now I'm teaching a series in our community under the power to create wealth and we're talking about what is in your hands. How Moses was told by God, when he asked God, how are we going to do all these great things in Egypt? He asked Moses, what do you hold in your hand? He said, a rod. The question is, did he really have a rod? What was really in his hands? Because the minute God comes and interacts with him, the next statement it says, and the next day, Moses got on his donkey with his wife and his children and the rod of God. Something has just happened to the rod. It is no longer Moses' rod. It is now whose rod? But who's going to wield it? Moses. So what is it that you carry that is unique to you? We may all sell chicken, but why do I buy yours? What is your intellectual capital? The good thing about intellectual capital is that it can be increased. It means you're good at something, get better at it. If you're a plumber, read more books, more manuals. Keep expanding that space, because that's where your money will come from. Sometimes the only reason you haven't gotten a big job is because the only job you've done is a neighborhood job. So when they say there's a job, they ask you, where else have you worked? You say, I mean, we can handle a two-bedroom. Say, I'm not for you. We deal with the hotel here. There's a plumber for the hotel, and there's a plumber for the neighborhood. Are they not all plumbers? Yes. What's the difference? Intellectual capital. What's your intellectual capital? Second, one of the capitals we despise is to be one of the most vital capitals. Emotional this one is serious. What do I mean by emotional capital? Emotional capital is the, your ability to remain stable and resilient even through trauma and crisis. Because business has ups and downs. Businesses have crises. My daughter was sharing because I came to Kathy this afternoon, one of her crises. By the way, I didn't bail her out. She paid it off herself. Let me quickly go through. She, she, she's, you some of you met her here. She's also a designer and she also does um, unique design uniforms for hotels. Like if you go to a hotel and you see the uniforms. So she had a client from the coast. And this client ordered about for 300 uniforms for staff, everything. If you go to a beach hotel, you know what we mean. From the chefs, <coughs> big job, right? Uniforms for waiters, for cooks, for chefs, for housekeepers, everything. The people who are making the uniform for her made full uniforms wrong color. <laughs> Why? You heard what she said? They were talking on WhatsApp. And I told her, go and see what they are doing. So she received a deposit from her client, 
sent everything samples and told them over the phone, when you finish the sample, show me. But because they worked before many times with these people, they decided they've seen it and they made it. The client could not receive it, it's not their color. But the she tell you she currently does with some of the uniforms? She gives our names, she gives gardeners. <laughs> If you visit her and you have workers, that's all she gives you. <laughs> she had to refund that deposit and carry the entire cost. I told her this is your emotional capital being drained, my friend. Other profits you have made, blow it back here. If I bail you out, next time you will forget the lesson you just learned. Am I harsh, Father? The question is simple. I want her to succeed. And these are the realities that happen. What does that simply mean? Diligence. Do not listen. There is a demon in Kenya called Fundi. <laughs> Fundi. <laughs> <laughs> the best is the head. <laughs> the only Fundi who can stress you is a Baba because you are there. <laughs> and even that I have had problems. <laughs> Let me explain. I cut my hair almost to the ground, almost, not like as a kid. But sometimes I'm at the bathers. I'm reading, I'm doing things. So one day I look at me. <laughs> and I don't know the fellow I'm seeing. All my hair is gone. Because it is assumption, everybody my age cuts everything. <laughs> Whose mistake? Mine. Why? It's a new baba. He doesn't know my head. These are the lessons. Emotional capital. So that day, if I don't have emotional capital, how much screaming will grow my hair? <laughs> Let's assume I get completely angry. Will I get my hair back? No. And you know he did a good job. So his skill is not the problem. Because to cut your hair clean means you're good at cutting. So he needs to do a bad job. He just needs to do the right job. You hear the difference? So that's emotional capital. You know why? Because in business, you have to have that because there are seasons of rejection. There are seasons of failure. There are seasons when just things don't work. You have the best product. Listen, I know people who imported a lot of uh, face masks just before the ban was lifted. <laughs> you know the difference? When you hear that happens, when you hear it cannot happen. Because God will tell you to stop selling before the order is removed. That's the difference. Mm, it's good. Here, you're driven by profit, not by a word. <laughs> That's the difference. I'll give you an example. As just before COVID hit, sometimes it's good not to know things. I was actually in New York when COVID hit. I didn't know there was a COVID or what that is. So I came back to Nairobi, I think February, then COVID was announced and the hotspot was New York. But that's almost a month or so after, so I'm fine. So we, we were meeting, of course, and some of you may know I like and so on, and we're also doing a program on Family TV, on GNP, on UTV, and they would come and record our services and then run the program. But that became their copyright. Now, sometimes God speaks to you, not that direct warning, but the nudge. Okay? So in that moment, God said to me, listen, these recordings belong to the channels. Now, part of my problem was the way me and you preach, we preach an hour, nine and a half. You've been to JPI, you know how it frustrates when you have to do 25 minutes per segment. Mm -hmm. You feel you haven't even started the conversation yet. Mm -hmm. Then you have to cut. So, what they would do is that they would record my meeting, which was one and a half hours, and break it into three programs. Now, the problem is these are cameramen, these are not members. So, they can cut me in the middle of a sentence. 
to be continued <laughs> next week. So I said, no, do this. Get your equipment. Record for yourself, then give them the programs. That way, yours are intact, theirs they can edit. Right? See how God put it. All I did, did we have the money? Did we have? All I said was, guys, to the community, this is what God has said to us. We need to do this. We need to get our own equipment. We need to go out production. Within, I think, 48 hours, we had all the money for all the cameras, the equipment, the software, everything. Here, when God speaks, everything moves. All right? So we began that. Then, how many people went through stress? You know how many churches went through stress. Some how people people up. Yeah, some people never recovered. Never reopened. Why? Because if you're not depending on the voice of God, you're depending on circumstances, you can be misled by what seems to be happening. So emotional capital is highly important, which means where is the school for emotional training? Sometimes the business and the money you lost was not a loss, it was training. I'll say that again. Sometimes that bad deal you had was not a loss. You think you lost money. God wasn't dealing with your money. You can replace that any time. He was dealing with your emotions and how you behave when money gets lost. He was dealing with how you respond when things don't go your way. So you have to learn to manage waves and stress and when things are not working. Emotional capital is very important. The third capital. And just before I go to the third one, there are two points I wanted to put in quickly. There are two kinds of emotion that drive a business. Pain or pleasure. So there are many people who do well because of fear of failure. They do well because they are terrified of where they have come from. In other words, I grew up in a poor family. Things were not working. I never want to go back there. Now when you're driven by pain, there is a danger. Because people who are driven by pain are the people who cross moral lines very easily. In other words, because of your fear of going back to brokenness, you're willing to break rules. Corruption is driven by pain. Pleasure works differently. The desire for a good thing is what should compel you not escape from a bad thing. In other words, how much good will I do with my life if I do well? How many lives can I transform if I increase? That becomes a much more powerful factor. And that is what helps you navigate emotional stress. Why did I start this business in the first place? I started it because I wanted to be a blessing to one, two, three. So, if everything has failed, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to try again. Pain, I will never. I will never do this again. I lost so much money, I don't want to hear about it. You know the difference? So, emotional capital. And it's important to invest in emotional capital. And some of the ways to invest is just well-being. Good health, good diet, good things. You know, some people, in the, in the quest of making money, <coughs> so you are making money angry all the time. It's a very confused state of mind. You make money, but you're angry. <laughs> so the emotional stress is not equal to the money. How does money affect your temper? Important. Sometimes when you've lost money, you should rejoice. Just to confuse your emotions. <laughs> <laughs> That's why David would say, why are you so down can store my soul? I will humble you first thing. In other words, he's talking to himself. Doesn't matter what has happened, you should not be downcast. It's just a bend 
in the journey. Take the bend, something will be better around the corner. Right? One of the best ways to build good emotional always surround yourself with caring people who care about your well-being. Spend time around. Listen, avoid toxic people. Avoid toxic people. People who are always telling you about the bad things that happen. When they watch news, they only highlight the dead people. Did you have that accident? How many people were murdered? Did you see anything else? People, listen, this is in every level. There are people who, their TikTok algorithm is only people who are falling. Social media, street, if you are to be followed, you are always looking for terrible things. Avoid toxic environments. Look for things. Bible says, whatsoever is good, whatsoever is of good report. If there is virtue, if there is praise, dwell, think on these things. I am always looking for good news. Because there is. It's easy to find if you look for it. I'm always trying to find out who succeeded, who did the impossible thing. Those are the stories that inspire me. I'm not, I don't want to find out about how people failed. And when you show me people who failed, I try to analyze why they failed, why they should not have succeeded. In other words, even that one, I'll try and turn it around. The third capital is relational capital. To me, personally, this is the most important capital that I carry. My greatest asset is my relational capital. <coughs> Believe it or not, it is true <coughs> that business is who you know. It is true. The problem is that when the world uses that term, they use it negatively. It means who you know meaning who you can bribe. In the kingdom it is who you really know. And how is relationship capital because this is a question you must always ask. What is the quality of the people in my relational circle? What is their quality? What kind of people can be called my friends? Or I can call my friends? How many people can act on your word? In other words, there are people today, if I make a call and say, so and so is coming to see you, they place value on you because of my word. Because of our relationship capital. They know I will not send someone to them who does not have value. I will not waste their time. And if I commit and say, this person you can do this way, that is it. Some of the greatest relationships we have today globally are based on that. What we do at our relational circles, we are honest with each other. So, if I send someone to Ken from Nairobi, I'll not just tell Ken he's a good person, I'll also tell Ken what to look out for. Because that's, our relationship is greater than that person. We're not going to jeopardize this one for that. They have not yet earned the right to be handled at our level. There are people I can commit 100% and say, that one, I can put my word on. <coughs> and if anything goes wrong, he can place that on me. That's, to me, that's the biggest. 90% of the business I have done successfully is based on relationships, capital. Even the world knows this. That is why, let me tell you guys, at the million and hundreds of million level of business. Business is done with a handshake, not a contract. That's the truth. At that level, people do business on a handshake. I told you we have people who are bringing aircraft to Liberia on a handshake. Give the story, give the story. Let me give you the story. And this troubles me. In Liberia, part of the projects that we are doing, the country, because it came out of war, is now growing and coming. But there are no proper airlines that we have, even charter aircraft within the country. So we were speaking with the Minister of Aviation, Director of Aviation, and they said to us, if you can assist with this, we will not only let you come in, we will give you the version of Wilson Airport to run and manage. Now what did I do? I looked into my relationships. One of my 
relationships in Nairobi owns 32 aircraft on individual. Oh, let me tell you, and he's a Kenyan, lest you think he's a white person. He lives in Kajiado. Every in his gated community, I was say, okay, I live in a gated community, but when I'm with him, my gated community is the village compared. In their gated community, in Narok, there is no road to their gated community. Everybody flies in. <laughs> All the neighbors have aircraft and hangars. Those are their garages. So if you have to buy land there, they first ask you, do you have an aircraft? Because <laughs> you can only approach it from the air. Otherwise, they will refuse to fix the road. They've got a terrible rough road to discourage cars. So him, in the morning, he comes to work at Wilson by air, works in the office, and in the evening, gets on his plane and goes home the way you drive. <laughs> Every day. <laughs> All of them. How did we build that relationship capital? He's actually my in-law. Remember Ken? My daughter's husband? That's his uncle. Ken is a pilot. He used to fly for her, for him. When he's tired, he calls Ken. Ken, I want to go home. Put you on in mind. So Ken goes to Wilson, flies him home and brings the plane back to Wilson. Then drives. So let me ask you. That person, what level do you think he thinks at? Now, that's the little capital. So I went to him and said, look, this is what we need to do. I need this vision in Liberia. Can you assist? He said, actually, I can. But what we need to do, right now, majority of my aircraft, and I won't tell you which country, one of the countries in West Africa, I am the national airline there. The way we work in the air is here. Here is the national airline of another country. And so all my pilots are there, but I have a crisis. During the Ukraine war, some of my pilots there were Ukrainians, so they have to go back to Ukraine to fight. So now I'm looking for new pilots to send there. You see, we all have different problems. Eh? <laughs> Very different problems in our lives. So, I can't do that. But the day I was going to see him, he happened to be this other young Somali guy. What that is. So when I go to see him in the office, he says, actually, I was going to give you bad news about Liberia, but one of my former students is here. And it's good we've talked about Liberia. Apparently, he knows the country and he likes it. He's even from there before. So he says to him, oh, please tell him, how many aircraft do you own? The guy says 12. 33-year-old Kenya. Who was this man's student? And I usually ask, what are we doing with our life? <laughs> the fellow says, no problem. The only problem is that all my aircraft are now hired by the UN. But I have four in Canada. I'll bring it to Liberia. And he shakes my hand, and that is settled. He's bringing four aircraft to Liberia in three months. That's how they do business there, no contract. Us, 5,000. Now, pastor, I own them. Now, I do it. And we expect to change something. Now, I did call him. Now, lawyer. He, Poverty. I once asked one of the people in those realms, and I asked, why do people do this? He said, listen, money is nothing. Reputation is everything. He said, in our circles, you lie once, you break your word once, it will take you a long time to be allowed back in. And they are not Christians. Relational 
digital capital is so important to me. The reason I'm in Liberia is because I have a relationship with somebody there. And they have a relationship with the government. So it's relationships that have opened all these doors. Relationship capital is found in the Bible. And uh, Moses' sister, relationship, puts him, you know the story, in the basket, and he's found by the Lord's daughter. And when the Lord's daughter asks Miriam, who can look after this church? Miriam says, I know a woman. He does not say it is Moses' mother. <coughs> I know a woman who can take care of this. From that moment, Moses is funded, taken care of, financed by the very nation he's going to destroy. How do you explain that math? That's God's math. That's how relationship capital works. Everywhere you go, you need relationship capital. Whether you believe it or not, the current political issue in our nation is about relationship <coughs> What you're calling dynasty are childhood relationships. What you're calling the other side are childhood relationships. Capital is human. Money is a facilitator. So the question is, what relationships do you have? Can they be turned into money? When, I send, when you send me to your friend, how do they see me? What kind of relationship have you designed with them that they will put value on who I am? See the power of relationship capital? Over the years, one of the greatest lessons my late father taught me that served me well in relationship capital is that he told me, always leave a place or a person better than you found it. Always leave a place or a person better than you find them. In other words, never burn bridges. Never burn bridges. You never know how life changes and people shift. Listen, there are places you can't help everywhere you come from. Some places, even if you try to live well, they still have a problem with you leaving. But you do your bit. Make sure that in the exit, you are not the one who had the bridge. You know what I just said? Mm -hmm. We normally say to people, whether it is a house or a house, we say, when you want to leave, was it a rocket? Come and say you want to leave. Because life is in faces. Nobody said you're going to work for us all your life. People improve, people change, people grow. We even put a demand on them to grow. Sometimes we pay for them courses. After they have increased, do you expect them to still be a me? No, no. No. You say, but when you leave, live well. You never know when you need this relationship. That's a thing you never do. Relationship capital goes over time. The time, one of the seasons that I think I acquired some of the most powerful relationships. When I was in Botswana, I made powerful relationships with government. Currently, there are some projects we are doing. All I needed to do was make a phone call to somebody in the government in Botswana and they say send them. Why? Because my reputation with them is intact. So when I make a call, they pay attention. You don't need appointment if I send you. You see? So I tell people, I, my greatest asset is not money. My greatest asset is relationships. My portfolio of relationships. There are people in this country that are on my phone book. You would not believe they are there. I never call them until I have to. And if I do, they know I'm not wasting their time. They pick it. And I only call and ask for things if I know they are worth asking for. I don't waste those relationships. The fact that I know them doesn't, it is not something to show off. It is an asset. Nobody shows off their assets. Yeah. The late Chris Kiru was my friend. There were many decisions he never made without calling me. Very many. He was my personal friend. We all consulted for him. 
I'll give you one story just to show you the power of relationships. Okay. About when I work, we read a lot of him. There was a time when, because I used to live in Botswana over eight years, there's a time the Kenyan delegation was going to Botswana visit us, and they wanted him to go. He told the president, he's not going to Botswana if I am not going. He said, that fellow, that is his country. I can't go without him, otherwise leave me alone. I traveled with the presidential team. I was in the same hotel with all the CSS. And anybody in the country wanted to see him had to see me first. I decided who saw him and who did not. Called relationship card. Now, when he fell sick, when he was in isolation, <coughs> and people couldn't see him, I get a phone call from one of our major embassies. And this is the ambassador. First of all, I see the call and it's almost really well the ambassador called me. He says, um, I was given your number. I've been trying to reach Mr. Kirubi. I can't get through to him. I'm told he's an isolation. He doesn't see anybody. Our country wants to invest in some of his business. But um, they say the only person he will listen to is you. So I said, okay, let me come to the embassy and hear what you want. So I went. I listened to them. What you are talking about was that. I called Chris. He picked it on the first ring. I told him what they wanted. He said, bring them to my house now. They discussed business. They added, today, that country is open up to me because of that one. It's called relationship. Let me tell you, if I never taught any other capital, to me, that is the most important capital you can ever have. And you must develop it. How do you develop it? Whenever you are around people, put their priorities first. That's how you develop relationship capital. When I'm with you, I do whatever I can do to make things better for you. That's how I'm building my relationship capital. So your memory of me is always good. You saw the difference? You know people cannot be fooled. When you're trying to use people, they know. Trying to take advantage, they know. So when you leave, they tell themselves that one. Watch out. And that's what they tell everybody else. You, do you know, you do not know how many people ask people about you on decisions that could have benefited you. So you know there's so and so. I'd like to do something with him, but who knows him well? So and so. I've got those kind of calls. Oh, there's this person I've been told. You want to hire him, but I'm told you know him. Right now, in that moment, in whose hands is that person's fate? So first of all, I must not have a prejudice against the person. We may not agree on many things, but that does not mean I'm going to tell a lie about their abilities. Mm. You understand? Yeah. We may not agree. I'll say, listen, me and him, not great times, but if you're asking for them for this, they are good at this. You know what happens? When they get whatever it is, they are informed on who recommended them. And they are shocked because they thought I would do it. So they end up calling back. What has just happened now? Our relationship has been what? They built. 